All right, I'll get us started. Um, we have two really interesting speakers, um, Patrick Mean and well, no, afterwards. <laughs> I, I promise they will be interesting. And uh, they need very little in the way of introduction. I thought uh, Patrick would get us started. Thank you for that. <laughs> 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 I don't think I've ever been praised in quite that. <laughs> Kind of less flattering form. <laughs> uh, I'm Patrick Deney, and I teach at the University of Notre Dame, and I'm delighted to be here with you. Thanks uh, to Dustin and to uh, all the folks here at Michigan State uh, for the invitation. I should mention that it's a particular um, delight uh, to take part in the LaFrock Forum. Um, I know it from, uh, from many decades uh, because my teacher and mentor, Kerry McWilliams, was a frequent guest at this. Uh, at this forum, uh, spoke pretty often, I think maybe half dozen to ten times, I'm not sure how many, but from those events, uh, some of it, I, what I regard as some of his best essays, uh, appeared as a result of invitations and, and uh, 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 presentations that he gave, which I had the pleasure of collecting as part of uh, Nachlas, as part of a collection of essays uh, that uh, his daughter and I pulled together uh, many years later uh, in a book. Uh, titled uh, Redeeming Democracy in America. So many of those essays were presented here at the LaFrock Forum. And I think uh, it's also um, in some ways fitting because I think like Kerry, uh, he was often invited because he was a bit of a contrarian in this setting. And I suppose that's my job here too, uh, is to be in some ways the contrarian. So I'll, I'll do that and try to earn my keep. So, this panel is, is entitled Liberalism as a Parentheses, Worthwhile Way of Life. Lefrac is going postmodern with big things in parentheses. <laughs> and so let me present uh, perhaps what is uh, one side of an argument, and perhaps we'll have uh, what your other side. It strikes me that at least if one follows, uh, if not social media, the media in general, that very few people today seem to be inordinately happy with our way of life. In general, I think there's agreement that no matter its source, we're experiencing widespread political and social discontent, extraordinary and deep levels of political dividedness, talk in various corners of an existing Cold War, and the possibility or prospects of a, I'm sorry, not a Cold War, a Cold Civil War, and the prospects and possibilities of a hot Civil War and what its consequences and likely outcome would be. One encounters not infrequent comparisons of the United States to the later stages of the Roman Empire, comparing it uh, as then as now to a time and a period of decay from a former glory, the extension and expansion of corruption, uh, and decline of a once great world straddling power to one that is increasingly sort of nostalgic uh, for the days of glory. Indeed, nostalgia seems to be present on all sides of the political spectrum. Nostalgia for a better time. Uh, and I do recall a world growing up in which it seemed to have been the general belief uh, that one could expect that one's children would do better uh, than one's parents, however one might describe that. In other words, we were part of an ascending civilization. Now, that's so much for what we might agree on, and, and I'm sure there will be disagreement even without about that characterization. But if, that, if we agree, if there's some agreement about um, the discontent side of this conference, of course, explanations for our discontents differ rather radically, depending um, considerably, if not entirely, on one's political perspective. On the left today, one is more likely than not to encounter arguments that the primary causes of our discontents lie in the economic realm, growing and extending and deepening forms of economic inequality, an inadequate social safety net in light of that inequality, festering inequalities due to our seemingly unsolvable racial divisions, and indeed the expansion of the sense of systemic inequality or belief in systemic inequality that is believed to have in its 
systemic net, nearly every group and identity that can claim justly or unjustly the status of an oppressed group. Now, on the right, long-standing concerns about the decay of morals and of virtues seem only to have deepened and accelerated. There seems to be no lack of evidence of an ongoing coarsening of our culture, the decay and decline of the primary institutions most responsible for moral formation, particularly the family, the role of community, associations, religious institutions, even the nation. Progressivism appears to be ascendant in the nation's elite institutions, increasingly intolerant of opposing or alternate viewpoints, whether in the academy, on technology platforms, who, who would have thought that Elon Musk would become the hero of conservatism? In, in media, and now even in the last day or two, setting up governmental agencies that appear to be charged with censoring and blocking challenges uh, to the dominant ideology. Those elite institutions today advance a story of our nation as one of pervasive and almost total, in, total injustice thus depriving this generation and any future generation of any grounds for pride or even investment in this American project. And the very existence of the nation as a political, union, a political unit is challenged in these same circles, increasingly to replace by that newly revived phrase, a new world order. A globalized elite class seeks a cosmopolitan global order that effectively would erase or altogether eliminate borders and national identities in the name of universal equality as well as the liberty itself. These two sides, of course, form deeply hostile camps, charging each other not only with being wrong, misguided, but outright malevolence and evil intent. No longer fellow citizens with reasonable disagreements. I remember that phrase being big in graduate school. Reasonable people can disagree. <laughs> How quaint and charming those times were. But rather regarded as enemies living within. Just in the past few days, the charges of treason being leveled on the floor of Congress to other congresspersons. Insurrection, perfidy, and even what one can't help but hear charges of heresy are thick in the air. According to the main currents within liberalism, both left and right liberals, our discontents are due not to liberalism properly understood, but our failure to achieve liberalism in its truest and its best form. That failure is due not to liberalism itself, but mainly to the opponents on the other side who are blocking the realization of a true liberalism. By the telling of conservatives, or we might call them classical liberals in the main, the achievement of genuine liberalism has been thwarted especially by progressivism. And I've spent amount, enough time in Straussian circles, some of them at Michigan State, to know very well the long-standing accusation uh, that a good founding, a founding that was based on solid principles, was corrupted by the foreign virus of progressivism, like a German import like a BMW, but a bad one, corrupting what was otherwise a virtuous founding and a virtuous set of principles. These principles of our founding were sound, but in fact, if one begins to really listen hard to the arguments, they've never really been realized. While they exist in the past, they yet have to be realized at some future time. While it having been articulated over 200 years ago, true liberalism lies somewhere or sometime in our future. By the telling of progressives, genuine liberalism, by their understanding, has been thwarted by conservatism or classical liberalism. One or a set of ideas premised on a false or narrow and even cruel understanding of human nature as individualistic and dominated by thoughts of greed. The progressive vision of a just and equitable society and a world have been thwarted especially by a set of conservative interests, especially malevolent economic actors and corporations, although one wonders how bad they'll continue to be. The Koch brothers are a regular object, Fox News, Tucker Carlson, foreign influence, collusion, and above all, Donald 
disinformation is the fundamental thing, an obstacle that prevents people from hearing what they would immediately agree is true. In other words, there's no contesting the truth of the progressive vision, if only its message could be heard without disinformation. In effect, then, these two versions or claims of the mantle of liberalism, claiming its name, are making the no true Scotsman argument. I know this because I'm on Twitter. People often use this as a, and I had to look it up on Wikipedia so I know that it's a thing. The no true Scotsman argument, that no true Scotsman would eat like this or eat this sort of thing. Our contemporary political and economic discontents, or even what we might term as a, that old phrase, a legitimation crisis, is not due to liberalism, but rather because true liberalism has never been tried. And the main reason that it has been thwarted is because of an opponent who are not themselves true liberals. They are the opponents of liberalism. Thus, this puts both sides in a position to understand the, op the opposition, the barrier to the realization of true liberalism, while denying any responsibility or complicity in what both agree are degraded, unjust, corrupt, and corrupt, and even ruinous way of life but both in the expectation that a true liberalism lies perhaps just around the corner, maybe in the next election. However, perhaps at this point, an explanation is needed that begins from the evidence. The evidence that is being seen from both sides, and it seems to me both sides have some merit to their arguments. From what we see around us, and not the partial and even partisan explanation, that arises from within the premises of the liberal frame. That is, I think we have to consider seriously the possibility that the causes of our discontents and these gathering catastrophes of our time are not due to the failures and obstacles being thrown up by one side or the other side of liberalism, but rather by the success of both sides, by the achievements of both sides. Both sides, in fact, are winning, not losing. Those economic discontents that are the main focus of the critique of the left, and the moral discontents that are the main focus and critique of the right, arise jointly from the fundamental commitments of liberalism from its very inception, and from the development of liberalism over time. And here and in this setting, I feel somewhat comfortable and even justified in referring or describing those essential characteristics of liberalism with recourse to Leo Strauss, and in particular to his seminal essay, The Three Waves of Modernity, in which I think his analysis sheds light on the actual conditions and evidence that we see before us. Now, as Strauss tells it, and I probably don't have to tell most people in this room, but I'll just quickly summarize. Liberalism, or what he calls broadly modernity, which is inaugurated, by the arguments of liberalism, which were just rehearsed in the last panel, begins foremost as an effort to overturn classical natural right, that tradition and way of thinking of the classical Greek, the Roman, and the Christian tradition. And I what Josh Mitchell pointed to his question whether that classical natural right, right was in fact in the, in the, in the, uh, uh, the bullseye, uh, especially at the beginnings of the Protestant Reformation and the liberal tradition that arguably arose from it. Now, for all of the differences of this tradition, of, within this tradition, the classical conception, I think, was held together by the, at least one core belief that we could identify, which is that the human order is based, or was based upon, a deep and indivisible connection between nature and telos. Human telos is given, not chosen. It's given as a matter of our nature. It's defined by our nature, and it's limited by our nature. And it is thus the duty and responsibility of a good political and social order, its leaders, its thinkers, its institutions, to foster, develop, and cultivate the conditions for the realization of that telos. While, of course, within this tradition, recognizing that no political order could achieve this end perfectly, nevertheless, it was the aspiration of goal. Now, for all of the differences between the two liberalisms I've been describing, its classical and its progressive versions, the right and the left, both agree, and both are heirs and inheritors 
of the project of attempting to overturn and to, and to reject and hold at bay this classical conception. The latest, uh, latest moment that I read a, a version of this was uh, Peter Berkowitz's recent discussion of Adrian Vermeule's latest book, That Evil Man, who associates, who uh, Berkowitz in his essay, associates this the following. He says that the view that government is rightly invested with the awesome responsibility and expansive power to direct citizens toward the supreme good for human beings, he writes, and I quote further, is commonly associated with pre-modern political philosophy and modern dictatorship. And because these two things are largely indistinguishable, of course, we are to reject them uh, because pre-modern political philosophy and modern dictatorship are more or less consistent with each other. And of course, this line could have been written by a progressive as well. We should. Rather, what we should know, and I think Strauss is helpful, liberalism in both of its versions sought to sunder the ancient connection between telos and nature, albeit in opposite directions. What Strauss described as the first wave of modernity, the figures that were discussed earlier today in the last panel, Hobbes, Locke, the founding fathers, classical liberalism, was perhaps most fundamentally a concerted effort to sever this ancient combination by retaining the idea and belief in human nature while rejecting the idea or belief in political end and purpose and telos. Thus the centrality of the state of nature scenario where one can elaborate and identify a universal and inexpungible human nature. But because of this nature, one has to that there is, to quote Hobbes, no summum bonum, no fetus lutus. There can't be what Aristotle or Aquinas regarded as the, as the universal and inexpungible end of human beings. It's a disconnection that takes place. Strauss then goes on to argue that the second wave of modernity, which is broadly described as historicism, regarded as lying at the roots of our progressive movement and the progressive tradition. The progressive tradition, or the second wave of modernity, the historicist tradition, also accepts the severing, but it reverses it. Humans have no nature. Rather, we are historical creatures. We are creatures whose nature develops and evolves in and through time. But they retain a telos. History, in some ways, points us to that telos. History aims toward an end, one that we intuit or we know or we assume we know but we can't finally know until we reach, sorry, Frank, the end of history. It's supposed to be a joke. History then, in some ways, becomes history is dis uh, history displaces nature, while telos is subsumed in the idea of progress. And while we point to thinkers, of course, and Strauss pointed to thinkers like Rousseau and Hegel and Marx, a thinker we could also point to as being not foreign, not a foreign import, would be someone like John Stuart Mill who argues at the very beginning of his essay on utilitarianism for the need of retaining the idea of telos, that all ethics is premised in his view of telos, but rejects the idea in some fundamental way that human beings have a nature. Rather, as he argues, human beings have to live in and through history. The whole point of his essay on liberty is that by overthrowing custom and tradition, history can begin. History will take place. And the way in which we achieve and we do this is through what he describes as the liberation of people to engage in experiments in living. There's a reason why this argument finds particularly fertile ground with thinkers like John Dewey and then someone who appeared here in the Bullfrog Forum, Richard Gordy, that these experiments in living found and premised within the liberal order are that which advances progress. Now, the creature that I would submit arises from the first wave of modernity, and this is follows Strauss, Strauss makes this actual claim, is, as Strauss calls it, homo economicus, the economic creature. The economic actor now liberated from telos, any governing or moral structure that, in some ways, limits or determines the ends or purposes of economics, aside from those ends and purposes defined by economics itself, acquisition, prosperity, Aristotle, of course, argues that acquisition is not in itself an ultimate good or end. In fact, it can be excessive. 
like anything, there's a mean between the extremes of acquisitiveness and penury. Uh, but it is up to household management, and ultimately the polis, to recognize what those limits to acquisition are. Thus, the political order is understood to limit and to define the market order. The first wave of modernity changes this relationship. Rather, society becomes marked by economic evaluation of all goods, calculations that become relevant to every sphere of life. How many of us are, are not familiar yet with describing students as consumers today? Or replacing the classical and Christian virtues with virtues such as industriousness, honesty, and toleration, according to the virtues uh, that were articulated recently by Mark Blitz as the modern virtues. The creature of the second wave of modernity is homo experimentus. Now that's my phrase. It is the creature, I think, called out by, among others, John Stuart, John Stuart Mill's call for experiments in living, which requires liberation from the despotism of custom and the commencement of history. This society, then, is one marked by increasing liberation of the individual, of course, from those formative institutions. Those are obstacles to experiments in living, family, community, church, even nation but ultimately from nature itself. Is there any more limiting institution, or I'm sorry, limiting feature of what it is to be a human than human nature? And in those areas where, in particular, our nature is most felt as a form of limitation, that's where experiments in living must be most radically undertaken. Experiments in living, of course, are undertaken in the sexual domain. Now note, I'm submitting here tonight, today, that neither side is wrong in its evaluation of the pathologies arising from the other side. Each side would say homo economicus or homo experimentus is a bad way of thinking about human beings. But both arise from the severing of nature and telos. Thus, understanding the kind of human that these two guises of liberalism comes into being to produce, it seems to me allows us to properly evaluate its way of life. In light of the human type that it aims to produce, strong evidence from all around us today belies the view that true liberalism has never been tried. It seems to me that we're living quite extremely and quite uh, uh, distinctly in its midst. While we might still cling to the belief that the true antinomy lies between classical liberalism and progressive liberalism, the fruit of their respective fracturing of telos from nature and nature from telos actually is increasingly indistinguishable. Homo economicus has melded into homo experimentus and vice versa. They are today effectively the same. And if we were wondering how to explain this phenomenon called woke capitalism, it strikes me as there's few, few ways of better understanding this than the way in which homo experimentus and this detached, liberated market will work hand in glove, creating a market uh, that prioritizes the experimental. The infinite choice demanded by the economic animal detached from telos is ultimately wed to the anti-cultural experimental animal that demands and expects more opportunities, ever more opportunities for experiments and living. And it seems to me that, to quote an authority that's probably widely respected in this room, that Pierre Manant saw this, these very roots, the connection of homo experiment, experimentus and homo economicus in his most recent book, Natural Law and rights in identifying this radical strain of modern liberalism not in a German, but rather in Thomas Hobbes, and the indefinite rights that he describes as inherent in human beings in his state of nature. The second and concluding point I'll make is that these two sides of the same coin constitute our contemporary ruling class. Liberalism isn't just a neutral form of ordering a, gov a, a government or a society for peace, a lot of what I heard in the last session, but liberating especially one set of strong people and allowing them, indeed giving them a kind of leave, to be in a dominant position over those who are not strong, who are arguably weak, who don't have the qualities to succeed or to be dominant in a society that liberates us both economically and culturally. This was described early on by, among others, a recently rediscovered thinker that it seems to me is relevant, 
James Burnham in his book, uh, The Rise of the Managerial Class. But what Burnham describes, and it seems to me a number of thinkers, and earlier on someone like Christopher Lash was identifying, was that the two sides that detach telos and nature lead to the liberation of those who are especially capable of operating a world without bumpers or barriers, without the kinds of guardrails, those who can thrive in a flattened economic and cultural landscape. Thus, Locke's industrious and rational are wed to Mill's progressed humans uh, who rightly govern over those who are backward, or as he would describe them, barbaric, whether domestic or international. The ruling class then today benefits both from the economic and anti-cultural experimental order, creating thus, I would conclude, the conditions that we face today, the conditions of its own political crisis, encountering a class uprising that rejects today both fruits of the detachment of nature from telos, both of the fruits of liberalism, both sides. This typically today goes by the name of populism, and of course it has its ugly visage, but it seems to me that it is comprehensible if we understand it to be an effort in some ways, or at least an intuition, that both sides of the liberal, liberal project have given rise to fruits on the left and the right that have uh, offered and given uh, extraordinary benefits in this flattened world uh, to those most capable of benefiting from those conditions, while increasingly uh, um, regarding it as uh, out of bounds or no longer acceptable the claims and, and position of those who can benefit from neither side. And what we're seeing today, it seems to me, is the effort, especially on the part of liberals, both left and right, desperately to put back together again the divide with which they are most comfortable, the divide between the left and the right liberals, to avoid, above all, a challenge to the position and condition, but ultimately, the separation of telos from nature. So we might have, if we're to, if we're to spe speculate with what's next, if anything is next, seems to me perhaps several possibilities, and I don't think these are exhaustive. But one of them strikes me as increasingly a kind of liberal hegemony. Liberalism detached from democracy. I think we're already seeing that happen. Liberalism, whether in the economic realm or in the realm of social experimentation, that defends the severing of telos from nature through raw imposition of power. That they will avoid popular referenda on either front in order to avoid the challenge to both the economic and experimental form of life that is prized by liberalism. The second possibility is Strauss's third wave of modernity, the Nietzschean wave. And here I begin, I think that we begin to see some of this. We're not really necessarily seeing it in academia today, we don't read these people. But the kind of post-liberal Nietzscheans, the Bronze Age, Herbert, whatever he's called, uh, the softer version of Jordan Peterson, perhaps. Uh, in some ways premised upon, as I think Strauss might have described it, the rejection both of nature and of telos, simply to be strong, to master in circumstance. And this is a particular appeal, as it always is, with young men, and to the extent that young men are not entering our institutions in the way that they might otherwise have, we're not seeing it. But this seems to me to be a really plausible possibility of a political future we may not wish for. And the third I would put back on the table, and I suppose why I was invited here today, was to suggest that modernity may have to revision and reimagine what it would look like to put back together what modernity has put asunder. What would a regime that has been liberal, but probably can't be anymore in the way in which we've understood, what would it look like to begin to put together again nature and telos? And is that a project that liberals today might be willing to entertain as possible? Thank you. So now, uh, Frank Young. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm sorry, I missed the uh, first couple of sessions. United Airlines saw fit to not deliver me here last night, but had me spend the um, evening in Newark. Uh, but, you know, I did manage to make it before the panel, so I'm grateful for that. Um, I, uh, I guess I should premise this by saying that Although I took courses in political theory from 
among others, Harvey Mansfield sitting in the audience, and I'm very grateful for that. I've never thought of myself as a political theorist. I've spent most of my career looking at uh, international relations, and in particular in the middle part of my career at the uh, development of uh, poor countries around the world. And uh, I've got a very institutional and more pragmatic understanding of uh, issues like, uh, like liberalism that may be a little bit divorced from the way that people are speaking about it here. And a lot of the disagreements actually are, are kind of definitional ones because I actually think that classical liberalism has been uh, uh, achieved in, in you know, many countries. And there are many countries today that I would uh, say um, a practice a, a form of classical liberalism. Uh, and I'm not going to define it with regard to any political thinker or theorist. I'm just going to tell you what I think are the major um, foundations. So liberalism is a doctrine that treats, uh, first of all, treats people as individuals that have equal moral worth, that recognizes a universality of an underlying uh, human being that has a certain degree uh, of dignity. It is highly associated with a certain cognitive mode known as modern natural science that believes that there is an empirical world outside of our subjective consciousnesses that can be apprehended and then um, manipulated through an experimental uh, method. Uh, it sees the moral priority of individuals over the particular cultural and historical groups that uh, uh, they uh, uh, may belong to, and uh, very importantly, if you want to recognize what is a classical liberal society, you, you recognize it by institutions. So if it has a rule of law that puts serious constraints on executive power, does not allow the powerful people in the political system to simply do whatever they want, uh, then you have the foundations of a liberal uh, rule of law. If you have constitutional checks and balances, uh, that embed in a, in a political structure those constraints uh, all the better uh, and ultimately that is done in the uh, interest of protecting the individual rights and so in that respect I think that it's associated uh, with quite a lot of countries today. Uh, in, in the political debate sometimes it is associated with market capitalism. I don't believe that that is a necessary uh, well, it, it, it's necessarily associated with capitalism, but it's not necessarily in favor of a certain view of market capitalism, very expansive view of it. So I would say that, you know, social democratic Denmark and Sweden are liberal societies, Japan is a liberal society, uh, and the United States remains a fundamentally classically liberal society in, in that sense, because those institutions are, uh, 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 are in place. Uh, and if you ask, you know, why are liberal societies better than their alternatives, I think there are basically three reasons. So the first reason, completely pragmatic one, that uh, you can see in the history of how liberalism evolved in the uh, middle of the 17th century. Liberalism is an effort to lower the temperature of politics by taking final ends off the table and saying that people need to learn how to live together because they're not going to agree on those final ends. So it is essentially a doctrine that seeks to govern over diversity and allow diverse societies to actually live productively uh, with each other, which means that the primary virtue of liberalism uh, is tolerance. Uh, and that's why I think that this sundering, you know, from ideas of a teleological final good, I, I mean, that's just not a, that's not a practical, implementable observation because what society in the world has you know consensus, broad consensus over what final goods are, represented by religion or cultural traditions or anything else. We all live in very <coughs> diverse societies. Uh, and if you don't have a liberal order to limit uh, the ability of people with power to impose one particular view of that good, you're going to end up in trouble. This is what Prime Minister Modi in, uh, in India is seeking to do right now by trying to shift uh, the national identity of India away from a liberal one to one that's based on Hindu nationalism. Second, uh, I would say justification for liberalism does have to do with a moral uh, consideration which has to do with human autonomy. Uh, this is not an invention of an experimental modern liberal. I think this basically comes out of the whole Judeo-Christian religious tradition. 
you know, Adam and Eve are cast out of the Garden of Eden because they make a choice. They make a wrong choice. They eat of the, uh, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Uh, and for that reason, they are tainted with original sin. But it is that ability to choose that makes them different from the rest of created nature. It gives them a moral status that is intermediate between God and the rest of nature. Uh, and that, I think, has all along, from that beginning point, been central in Christian doctrine, that people are moral agents. And if you ask, in what sense could anybody believe that human beings are under the skin all equal to each other, it is precisely in that ability uh, to choose. It's something that was represented by Martin Luther King saying, I want my children to be judged not by the color of their skin, but by the content of their characters. Because every child born in the world has that ability to make basic moral choices, and this is something that liberal societies seek to uh, preserve. Then the final one has to do with economics, uh, and in fact, uh, there is a, a, you know, among the uh, choices that uh, are protected in liberal societies is the right to own private property, to transact, uh, creating a, a rule of law that protects commercial transactions. Uh, the other observation I find very strange is this notion that there's not such a thing as history. You know, you can have human nature and you can have history. They're not mutually exclusive because history doesn't evolve in, in just random ways that are simply willed by elite liberals. They uh, evolve because human, human beings are dealing with a created world that they have partly created and it's partly given to them, but it changes over time. If you don't believe, uh, I have a, if you want to see my fuller argument about this, I, I had the cover of the weekend section of the Wall Street Journal tomorrow, so you can read, read about this at much greater length. But if you don't think that history exists in this Hegelian sense, try living in Guatemala for a while, or try living in Myanmar, or in Nigeria, or some other poor, disorganized, poorly governed, corrupt country, and ask yourself why it is that every single year, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, sometimes millions of people want to leave these countries, uh, which are not paradises of communal, you know, teleological togetherness. They're very poor, disorganized, and children do not have opportunities uh, for education, for improving themselves. And where do they want to go? They don't want to go to Russia, they don't want to go to China, they don't want to go to Venezuela, they want to go to Western Europe or the United States or some other liberal society. So they understand that there is such a thing as history. Uh, they do think that it does have a certain teleology that makes the things closer to the end of history, nicer places to live than uh, the places that they are coming from. So don't tell me there's no such thing as history or that's somehow a meaningless uh, kind of experimental thing that somebody just thought of a couple centuries ago. So uh, that economic development is really quite important. So I think that I agree with Patrick that there's a lot of upset with the current order, but I do not think that these are the result of, um, you know, the characteristics of what I would call classical liberalism that I just laid out for you. I think that these are based on deformations uh, that have been undertaken by both uh, the right and the left, and they are not intrinsic to liberalism itself. Uh, so the deformation on the right really is what's now called neoliberalism. Uh, you can't have a modern society, you can't have the kind of health care, the longevity, the level of prosperity that we take for granted if you don't have a market system that protects property rights and freedom to transact. But what began to happen uh, in the 1970s and 80s is you had a much more extreme version of this that was very anti-status, that worshipped the market in a certain uh, sense, in ways that really were not empirically supported by the uh, actual consequences you know, that, that uh, ensued from this. And it did produce a lot of uh, disruption, uh, job loss, you know, outsourcing, inequality, uh, and so forth. And I think that uh, that is not something that is intrinsic to capitalism, or not to democratic capitalism, because I think a stable liberal system really does have to be complemented by a democratic political order that does a, a certain amount of redistribution because if you simply let a liberal market run wild by itself, you are going to get these unsustainable degrees of in, uh, economic inequality. But there was a formula that was pretty good 
uh, you know, social democratic Europe saw several decades of really extraordinary growth and shared prosperity uh, after 1945 based on essentially a liberal and a democratic uh, 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 formula. So that's a distortion on the right. On the left, the distortion was taking this basic view of human autonomy, which I think most of us would share. Like, most of us don't want to be told what kind of job we have to have, who we're going to marry, what city we're going to live in. You know, we all want to make these choices, but it did uh, absolutize that sense of autonomy. Uh, it's true that the, you know, the furthest uh, efforts to push autonomy were in the, uh, in the realm of family and sexuality uh, and that sort of thing. And so a lot of the upset you know, with, with that particular extension of autonomy uh, have to do with you know, a particular subset uh, 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 view. And I think the problem is not that this is the inevitable uh, evolution of liberal ideas, it is a, a deformation. That is to say, if you look at what's wrong with identity politics today, and kind of the, so, you know, I've described the neoliberal rights, and now I'm describing what you might call the uh, woke liberalism on the left. If you say, what's the, uh, what's the problem uh, with that view? I would say there's no problem with a liberal interpretation of identity politics, because, you know, that form of identity politics simply said there are a lot of marginalized groups, there are African Americans and women, and, gays and lesbians that are not being, they're, they're promised uh, equal treatment in a liberal regime and they're not getting it. And that's basically you know, the Martin Luther King understanding of the civil rights movement, that he wants black Americans to be treated identically, judged as individuals like every other white American. But there is a progressive view of identity politics that basically is not an extension of liberal views, it is an attack on liberal uh, it's a kind of group politics that says that our group identities, including identities that are completely ascriptive, that we're born with, that we have no control over, like our race, ethnicity, gender, uh, and so forth, uh, are fundamental, they're essential to who we are, and we should not be treated as individuals, but we should be treated as, um, uh, as members of those groups, and that society should give preferences based on that. That is not a liberal principle. That is an attack on liberal principle. Furthermore, you know, you also get other versions of critical theory that say that somehow sexism, slavery, colonialism, uh, a lot of the injustices historically that occurred um, is true under uh, so-called liberal regimes or somehow intrinsic to the doctrine uh, of liberalism. And I think that if you look carefully at you know, the history of slavery and the anti-slavery movement, uh, the opposition to that uh, did come from liberals, in fact, who uh, were made to realize that these institutions did not, uh, were not ultimately compatible with, uh, uh, with their underlying belief in universalism of human uh, equality. So it is a deformation. Woke liberalism is a deformation and not a logical extension uh, of liberalism uh, itself. Now, I do want to say a little bit about the topic of this panel, which is supposed to be you know, the way of life uh, that is um, encouraged in a liberal society. And I think that you know, there, uh, is a, there is definitely a problem there, because as I said, the premise of liberalism is you're going to lower the sites of politics, not to the good life, but to life itself, and permit a lot of different ways of uh, of uh, acting and being, and if you want to live in a society where your happiness is somehow based on the fact that everybody else in your society agrees with you on fundamental issues, and you all go to the same church, and you worship the same God, and so forth, yeah, you're going to be uh, unhappy about that. Um, but I think that there are uh, a couple of respect, I mean, so in the first place, I'd like to see the kind of society where that kind of uh, cultural unity really exists, and where the problem of diversity uh, is not a is not a big issue. I mean, you look at contemporary Poland; you can't find a more religiously and ethnically homogeneous society uh, in the world. But they're still very much divided between you know more urban, more liberal Poles and, and, and those that uh, are more religious. So they've got a diversity problem uh, as well. And you know, liberalism is one of the ways that you uh, that you overcome it, but. 
what's a what's a positive model of a liberal society? I would say every <laughs> every civilization that uh, was more liberal produced a kind of efflorescence of innovation uh, and growth and cultural richness that non-liberal societies simply could. Would you rather live as an intellectual in Athens or Spartan? Right? How many Spartan philosophers do you read in your classes? Right? Zero, because Athens was a liberal society compared to Sparta. Sparta was too busy whipping everybody into shape, you know, so that they could march in the phalanx. Uh, the Athenians were actually sitting around uh, debating different uh, ideas. You think about, you know, the, the golden age of Holland. Holland was one of the first liberal societies in Europe that produced unbelievable, you know, uh, well, first of all, an unbelievable commercial system, an unbelievable richness that supported the arts. You look at uh, Fin de Siecle uh, Vienna, uh, that produced, you know, Hugo von Hofmannsthal and Sigmund Freud and Gustav Mahler. There is this uh, incredible um, moment, you know, when uh, Franklin Roosevelt uh, was overseeing the Manhattan Project, and he met with four Hungarian physicists, Leo Szilard, uh, John von Neumann, Eber Teller, and Eugene Wigner, uh, all of the Nobel Prize winners in physics, and it turned out they had all gone to the same gymnasium back in Budapest, which was the other side, you know, the Hungarian side of the, Austro the liberal Austro-Hungarian Empire. Uh, they were all Jews that had to escape uh, Europe because a liberal Vienna uh, and a liberal Budapest were now being replaced by an authoritarian one. Uh, and, uh, you know, the kind of freedom that they experienced in that earlier phase simply was not achievable in a uh, non-liberal uh, central, uh, central Europe. So that's intellectually and culturally, uh, I would say, you see plenty of examples of that here in the United States, like where does jazz come from, or American popular music, or all the, you know, which has really conquered the rest of the world. Uh, you know, it comes from the fact that uh, you know, the, the great American songbook, who's it written by? It's written by a lot of immigrant Jews, like Dorothy Fields or Irving Berlin, that somehow mixed, you know, their experience as immigrants with uh, black experience in the United States. And believe me, 20th century popular music is a lot better than 19th century popular music. And it's all done by a bunch of, you know, wasp Christians. Although there were some wasp Christians, like, uh, you know, like Hoagy Carmichael, but, but you know, it, it, it was diversity that actually uh, fostered that kind of that kind of creativity. Um, finally, let's get to simply you know, martial virtue, <laughs> because there is this charge that um, you know that liberal societies produce soft people that are too uh, material preoccupied and, and self-centered to actually even defend themselves in their own liberal way of life. And I do think that. Um, there is something to that charge because, you know, be, because liberalism is basically a lowering of the size of, of politics, uh, it tends to be the most appreciated when you see the opposite of it, right? So when you live in a world that is wracked by war, like Europe was at the end of the 150 years of religious wars uh, uh, following the Protestant Revolution, or as Europe was again, in 1945, following on two uh, horrendous uh, world wars, you like liberal institutions because you just want to survive. You know, you, 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 you realize that aspiring to have your ethnic group dominate other ethnic groups is really not a safe way to, uh, to live, so you accept liberalism. Or if you live in a dictatorship, you know, if you lived in the communist world uh, in the days when there was the Soviet Union, you really wanted to live in a liberal society where you could be free to travel, to think, to criticize, to do all the sorts of things we do in liberal societies. Uh, and for that reason, the first generation after the fall of communism were dedicated liberals. But I think the problem is that it's easy to take liberalism for granted, right? It's easy to just assume that our peace and prosperity are going to be there forever because if you've grown up, you know, after 1945 or after, especially in Eastern Europe, after the fall of the Berlin Wall, you say, well, the world's been pretty good and I actually think the big problem is now the European Union. That's the really evil source of dictatorship in, uh, in my life. Uh, and uh, it's sometimes helpful to be reminded 
that the real alternative to liberalism is something pretty terrible. And in that respect, uh, I actually think that Mr. Putin has done us a big favor because he's kind of reminded us that, well, you know, he's the one that said that liberalism is an obsolete doctrine back in 2000, uh, 2019. But in terms of just martial virtues, it's very interesting what's going on in the Ukraine war right now. A quarter million Ukrainians came back to Ukraine in order to fight the Russians. So right now, all work on the, the, the metro in Warsaw has stopped. These were all emigre Ukrainians that were you know, building the metro. They've all gone back to fight for their country. In the meantime, uh, thousands of Russians are leaving Russia because they don't want to fight in, uh, in Putin's war. And it's actually the fact that Ukraine is to, to Ukraine has evolved as a liberal society that they're doing this, you know, that they're not centralized. They've got a very decentralized command structure that allows uh, lower level commanders to take initiative. Uh, the Russians have a single guy at the top that is giving the orders. Uh, he seems to be pretty isolated and out of touch with reality, which is why they've ended up in such a disastrous uh, strategic situation. But the tactical situation is also not good because nobody's allowed to think for themselves and they can't take advantage of local knowledge and, and initiative and the like. And, life. and um, you know, I think that that just indicates that liberal societies are perfectly capable of being uh, martial if they are correctly unified with a, a national idea. Uh, so this is an issue that I've written about in, in in my forthcoming book that has the same title as this conference, but uh, you know, liberalism actually does need a nation in order to, uh, to function. Uh, liberalism as an abstract concept is not something that people fight for. They only fight for it when it's actually embodied in an actual nation. There are a number of reasons why this is true and having to do, with, I think, just with the uh, sort of the, um, the social nature of human uh, consciousness. So if you think about Ukraine right now, there's this argument going on, are they actually fighting for democracy or are they fighting just for sovereignty and they don't actually care what kind of regime they have. And I think it's sort of a meaningless question. I, I've been to Ukraine a lot in the last eight years and I know a lot of Ukrainians and I know there's a lot of them that actually really do believe in some version of liberalism and some version, you know, they want to be Europeans. But there are also patriotic Ukrainians that wouldn't sacrifice themselves for liberalism in another country. And so the two are very closely uh, intertwined. And that's another example of the way I think that classical liberalism works. It's not a break from every previous cultural tradition. It actually needs those cultural traditions in order to, to survive. And some of the best uh, existing, real existing, you know, uh, as the Marxists used to say some of the best real existing liberal societies are ones that do have a strong sense of national identity, but that national identity has to be a liberal one. And if it's, it degenerates into something in which there's an assumption that everybody's going to agree on a single final end defined by religion or by uh, a particular kind of non-inclusive version of national culture, uh, then uh, it's uh, really not going to work as the basis of a truly liberal society. So, for that. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Let me thank our speakers for their serious and engaging talks. In composing this reflection on the musicians, I made use of Professor Dean's well known Why Liberalism Failed. Professor Fukuyama assumed to be well known, forthcoming, liberalism and its discontents, which he graciously shared with me. I learned a lot from both books. Our speakers agreed that in both economic and social life, liberalism can and in fact has taken its goal of protecting individual liberty too far. As regards the dangers posed by an overly free market, they appear to be at least close to agreement. As regards social life, they appear to agree about some of the excesses but it's clear enough that they draw the line in different places and for different reasons. So I thought I'd start with some thoughts about this point of disagreement. In his book, 
Professor Fukuyama appears to acknowledge that there's some truth in Professor Deneen's account of how liberalism tends to replace traditional culture with a kind of anti-culture, and then concedes that the, quote, critique of liberalism, that liberal societies provide no strong common moral horizon around which community can be built, is true enough, end quote. But Professor Fukuyama denies that this is a damning problem for liberalism. He appears to regard Professor Deneen's claims about how far liberalism has destroyed older traditions as an exaggeration and suggests that liberal nations could in any event provide a sufficient sense of community by cultivating a positive vision of their liberal national identity. He notes that relatively liberal societies have in fact produced vibrant arts and culture, all while protecting its own dignity. He thus suggests that a sufficient sense of community could be based on proud appeals to such liberal cultural traditions. This strikes me as very practical advice to the extent that we can follow it but I have some doubts about how, how far we can. In the first place, Professor Fukuyama, Fukuyama himself appears to have some doubt as to whether liberal societies as they currently are will be sufficiently willing to make such proud appeals. I suspect I have greater doubts on this point. But I also doubt whether such cultural traditions as we still have and are likely to continue to have will be adequate to the task of promoting a strong enough sense of community. <clears throat> Few will deny Professor Fukuyama's examples of the vibrant arts and cultures that have derived from relatively liberal societies, save perhaps some of his American ones. By mentioning Hollywood and hip-hop, he appears to include what are now primarily powerful forms of anti-culture, though as a lover of hip-hop, I'm sorry to admit it. As regards the other examples, it seems true but insufficient to attribute them to the liberalism of the societies in which they occur. As far as I know, these examples all derive from cultures formed before the societies became relatively liberal. The first example, Heraclean and Athens, did produce unmatched flourishing in arts and culture. But this flourishing appears to have resulted, in part, from the fact that a recently more aristocratic and illiberal society was growing more free, or more corrupt. Traditions of great gravity were being cast aside. This meant serious people had to think for themselves an explosion in art and philosophy was the result. It is in keeping with this that Athens began its manifest political decline under the demagogue Cleon only a few years after Pericles praised the free Athenian way of life. As far as I know, every example of apparently liberal high culture similarly owes a manifest debt to non-liberal traditions, and every such period can plausibly be described as one during which stricter morals were being relaxed. If this is right, once those morals have been relaxed, once the tension is gone, that is, once citizens have come to take for granted their new, less morally serious ways of life, the basis for cultural and artistic excellence will be gone. It therefore seems reasonable to doubt that strictly liberal practices and traditions can suffice for forming a culture that satisfactorily sustains human flourishing. Since we lack any clear historical or empirical evidence, deciding this question Require answering the very complicated question of exactly what purposes such a culture needs to serve. Professor Deneen's discussion of anti-culture offers some fundamental answers to this question. Let me suggest one closely related purpose that strikes me as quite important and perhaps clarifying. No one can live well while predominantly focusing his conscious efforts on seeking his own narrowly understood individual good. A culture is therefore needed to raise our aims by giving us objects worthy of devotion. Can liberal societies do so? There's no doubt that they have and to some extent still can. Professor Fukuyama cites the moving account of a civil war officer risking his life in defense of our liberal order out of a desire to protect human dignity in general. This has no doubt happened countless times, but again, it has always happened in liberal societies in which pre-liberal traditions have continued to exist. And we've been given clear reason to wonder whether the defense of liberal societies can continue to appear worthwhile as those traditions lose their power. In the wake of U Ukrainians' proud defense of their nation, we received polling data according to which nearly 40% of Americans claimed they would flee rather than defend their country. The number was nearly 50% among the youngest cohort polled. The causes of this are manifold, but both authors' books 
point to trends which suggest to me that many Americans, especially among our elite, who in other ways seem to be the strongest proponents of socialism, have come to doubt deep in their hearts the worthiness of our liberal order. It is often the same people who strongly champion certain non, or rather anti-traditional forms of individual autonomy, who also oppose the aim of individual autonomy when it impedes what they regard as justice for certain groups. And these same people are, at least at times, at pains to deny the superiority of liberal society or culture to any other. I want to make two suggestions about this phenomenon. In the first place, an extreme egalitarianism, a desire for equal respect and equal outcomes in general, appears to animate much of these individuals' opposition to individual autonomy. Probably every pursuit of equality can somehow be defended as necessary for some kind of autonomy. But in many cases, I don't think this is the genuine or primary motive. In many cases, it's not even alleged. The demand articulated stops at the demand for equality. The distinction I have in mind can be clarified by an example where both concerns were present, though in different degrees and different people. During the gay marriage debates, a friend admitted to me that his passionate concern about the issue was much less rooted in a wish for gays to be able to choose married life than in anger at those who did not accord equal respect to gays. Now, both of our speakers look to the democratic form of our liberal order with the hope that it can moderate some of liberalism's excesses. I think this is very reasonable in current circumstances. Professor Deneen goes further and suggests that our liberal order has in fact produced a new form of aristocracy or oligarchy. I think this suggestion points to a genuine and concerning phenomenon. But I also think it likely that as both Plato and Tocqueville would appear to predict, it's especially the democratic form of our regime that has produced the peculiarly illiberal egalitarianism we see today. My second suggestion about those passionately supporting both liberalism and forms of illiberal egalitarianism is a little complicated, and I'm afraid I have to oversimplify. When individuals hold such incompatible views, it's safe to assert that they don't understand themselves. The energy with which they may defend each view indicates that they have not come to hold these positions as a result of merely going along with popular trends. Something important is at stake for them. And their manifest confusion gives us warrant to look for it somewhere other than the accounts they most often give of themselves. Now their manifold positions appear to belong together only in the disdain each implies for the liberal order as it currently exists. They can't hold these positions without on some level being deeply dissatisfied with the current liberal order. But again, there are specific criticisms of that order, which are the result of the inconsistent application of some of those principles, can't be taken to articulate the deepest sources of their discontent. Furthermore, over the last two decades or so, much progress has been made in many spheres according to liberal and egalitarian principles, though notably not in incomplete a form of inequality which, as is equally noteworthy, does not produce so much outrage in the group I have in mind. But this progress has not lessened their discontent. Their stated criticisms, therefore, have over time come to refer to what are by any reasonable measure lesser injustices. But their discontent is manifestly increased. They are evidently attempting to vent a discontent with our liberal order that is not adequately rooted in the moral principles they're consistently willing to acknowledge. I therefore suggest that their deepest source of dissatisfaction is in fact the liberal way of life in general, including not least their own otherwise morally easygoing lives. Thus, they occasionally admit to finding the average American deplorable, and they clearly deplore him not only for his alleged racism and sexism, but how deeply does their way of life differ from his, aside from their support for their causes, which is for the most part merely verbal. Now, why is it that the liberal order now seems less worthy of devotion? We saw that human dignity is a worthy cause. Our speakers agree that the defense of human dignity requires some protection of individual liberty. But a genuine sense of dignity requires much more than mere liberty. It requires that we pursue goals that we respect ourselves from pursuing. And it may well be that most of us can consistently find and pursue such goals only with the help of older pre-liberal traditions. Traditions that claim to begin with the acceptance of due 
is not founded on consent. Left to choose our duties for ourselves, most of us mostly just follow our ever-changing preferences. To the extent that the liberal order has eradicated pre-liberal traditions, it would follow that the defense of that order would cease to be a defense of true human dignity. It therefore appears to me that much depends on the ability of the liberal order to retain some pre-liberal traditions. We come then to the question of whether liberalism must relentlessly eviscerate traditions in the manner Professor Deneen describes. The promise of liberalism seemed to be that each could maintain his own view of the life, so long as he respected everyone else's right to do the same. Why has this resulted in a more or less steady erosion of pre-liberal moral and religious belief? And did it have to? It's not clear to me exactly how Professor Deneen answers these questions. This outcome does appear to be the logical result of holding the foundational anthropological beliefs about individual freedom that he finds underlying our liberal laws and political arrangements. But for some time, we had liberal laws while relatively few of our citizens accepted these foundational beliefs, and even fewer did so with a clear and consistent understanding of them. Why then have these beliefs come to be increasingly accepted? I think Professor Green explains admirably well how the instability required by free markets encourages this tendency. It separates many of us from our families and other tight knit communities, thus leaving us more like the isolated individuals liberal theory begins with. But the change that has taken place would appear to me to be both more intelligible and more concerning if the liberal laws themselves contributed to the acceptance of the foundational beliefs. I'm asking, in effect, whether acknowledgement of the legal right to live as one pleases does not tend in many souls to devolve into or towards belief in the moral right to so live. Consider the rapid change in attitudes about gay marriage among Republicans after the Supreme Court's decision. In fact, in this case, there's been at least one relevant study. It showed that beliefs about norms surrounding gay marriage changed even within weeks of that decision. After becoming legally permissible, moral acceptance of gay marriage increased quickly. To try to state briefly what is, I think, the most important source of this phenomenon, I'd suggest that the political community is always taken to be, in a sense, the most authoritative community for its citizens. It manifestly has the power to decide which other associations exist within. In healthy political communities, citizens naturally believe their community uses its power justly. That is, it permits what it permits and forbids what it forbids, in accordance with merit for the common good. These beliefs about merit and the common good then tend naturally but naively to be taken as entailing sufficient guidance toward living well or virtue. It's probably this last premise that strikes most people as the least plausible one, but I point out that I find quite regularly that both idealistic and cynical students gravitate toward the view that the good citizen in a decent political order is the good person. Thus, when the political community refuses to give its citizens guidance about which religion to follow, to cite what I think is the most important example of what I'm talking about, many will naturally struggle to regard religious belief as a matter of truly great importance. Professor Deneen points out that the ancients understood the laws to be teachers, and thus sought to use them to teach virtue. I'm adding, and I believe the classical philosophers understood this too, that even when the laws are not intended virtue, there is a natural human tendency to take them to do so. I therefore doubt that having reached the point we reach, there's good reason to hope we can stop liberalism's tendency to deprive our communal lives of what makes life most worth living for most people. I hasten to add that as Professor Fukuyama observes, this is also a severe practical problem for opponents of liberalism. To the extent that liberalism has destroyed our pre-liberal cultural resources, it has greatly diminished any ground there may have been for a popular and peaceful alternative to liberalism. It may well be that our likeliest prospects are continued life under an ever more dehumanizing liberalism, which is also ever less liberal in important respects, or violence that's almost certain to be far worse as we find. If such is our situation, we do well to focus on slowing the decay. And I believe both speakers have useful suggestions for how we can do so. Now, it's always reasonable to make the best of the situation. 
but I know the idea of merely slowing the decay will be insufficiently satisfying for many people. I certainly don't recommend it as a political slogan. So while restricting myself to what I regard as rational hopes, I'll note that politics admits of little in the way of safe predictions. I believe what I've set out is the most likely course for the foreseeable future. But the foreseeable future is only one big, unpredictable event away from being over. It is therefore not unreasonable also to keep a lookout for new and more promising alternatives. Thank you. So I, I thought I'd first see if, if uh, either of you want to respond to each other or to what I said or to other words. Yeah. No, it's fine. Well, no, I'll just say one thing. I, I actually, the, the point you made about the success of liberal societies resting on pre-liberal or pre-democratic uh, traditions, I think is true. Uh, and that's particularly the case in, in terms of national identities, where you know the reason that liberal democracy could work in Western Europe is that you went through several centuries of violence to create relatively homogeneous you know, nation states, and it's, you know, they're kind of the um, beneficiaries of that non-liberal past. And you know, I think it's a legitimate question whether in the future, if you only have a liberal order, whether you can actually create those kinds of uh, identities in the future. But that's you know, to me an open question, so I actually think that's a good observation. Uh, question to both, both panelists, please. What we have here is two different theories of history notwithstanding the attempt to look at empirical data. Uh, Mr. Fabiano, I don't think one needs to be a Straussian to have some wonderment about uh, history. And let me just give you two quotes from Nietzsche. Um, God is dead, man killed him. Uh, it's the church and not its poison that offends us. And Nietzsche's critique of this, of, of Hegel and the, and the progressive liberal vision, uh, was that it was really, it was the outworking of Christianity that hit its Christianity. It was a long-suffering theodicy. Uh, and that in order for the West to move past its, uh, its state of decay, uh, that would have to be um, got rid of. And, and we can, I, I've spent liberalism too, but I'm the university and postmodernism is winning. And, and what we mean by that in this case is not the idea that there's a meta narrative, a, a grander meaning of history, but the very idea that there's only a narrative, uh, and, and identity as well, as a kind of an anti liberal um, trope. So, do you think, in fact, that you, you still retain too much of a, a liberal triumph for this view? That's the first question. The second, related to that, uh, one proof that maybe there's something really wrong with this idea of identity is not a continuation of liberalism, of liberal pluralism, but it's something quite different, is the consequence for black America with, from identity politics. So the argument that's often made on the left is civil rights goes to women's rights, goes to gay rights, goes to transgender rights. The problem with the latter claim is that, uh, as matters stand, it looks as if for you not to, to be opposed to some version of equal rights, so to speak, you're accused of heteronormativity and attending a homophobic church, which harms black Americans most of all. So I think that's a big problem. Second, um, what would be wrong with the Tocquevillian vision? What would be wrong with acknowledging that there's actually something there that, that's superior to a kind of liberal triumphalism, which I think you're still talking about? So Tocqueville said, yes, the age of equality is upon us, but it can go in two different directions. It can go equality and servitude and equality of, of, of liberty. And so there isn't this inevitable movement once we get rid of the deformations toward liberalism. And Patrick, you, I like the story you tell. Uh, you're, so where Mr. Pugliano's is liberal ascendancy, Patrick's uh, is a kind of dialectical decay. Uh, so you've got homo economicus giving way to homo experimentus. But, and you want to suggest that we have to return to nature and some understanding of common good. But you remember this, Plato's Book 8 Republic. It's the exact same movement from oligarchy 
democracy, followed by an internal logic that, that ultimately discloses tyranny. But there, he doesn't offer the common good of nature. It's only philosophy that can save us. So what I'm trying to do is suggest that the, the, the movement that you're suggesting Aristotle can in some way resolve is resolved in a different way. Uh, well, um, I don't know. I never thought of myself as a liberal triumphalist. I've been pretty, pretty pessimistic in recent years. Um, uh, but, you know, a lot of what you said is premised on the fact that nobody can fight back against this particular understanding of postmodernist relativism and, uh, you know, the, the dominance that it has in universities. And I'm not convinced that that's true. Because you know some of it, uh, I think actually uh, is pretty evident to a lot of people. I mean, what's wrong and, and illiberal about it is pretty evident to a lot of people. Uh, the question I suppose for the future is, and, and I, I guess the you know when I argue with my progressive friends about this, the, the argument is really actually never about whether it's a bad thing that they're intolerant progressives. The question is really how big a phenomenon is this. You know? compared to the other kinds of threats we face as a society. In my view, compared to the outright threat to American democracy posed by the contemporary right, it's, it's a pretty minor thing. But I do admit that within certain cultural precinct, precincts, it is, pretty, uh, uh, it is pretty important. And part of its importance is, I think what Patrick was referring to, it really sets people on the right off and pushes them into more extreme positions than they would otherwise hold, and so there has to be some kind of way of breaking this doom loop uh, you know, between the two sides, but I'm not convinced that that can't be done uh, through you know, good old uh, liberal uh, deliberation and, and discourse. So, uh, Josh, uh, you know, we've been having these conversations for a long time, and uh, uh, your question is the question that's in everyone's mind. Uh, it's what is to be done. You, you quote Heidegger, I'll quote Lenin. There they are. Uh, well, only philosophy can save us. Um, so I, 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 no, I agree that um, you know we are um, identifiably uh, in the late the late stages of World Game Nine decay, um, like Plato's telling. And and you certainly see a lot of evidence that we have slipped from what we might call democracy into tyranny. Whatever, whatever form you think that is, whether it's technology, whether it's sort of outright political oppression, and so forth. Um, and I think, you know, David, I want to thank you for your really terrific comments because um, I think for a long time there was a, a degree of certainly not confidence, but but at least hope among more conservative-minded people that there was enough of that Tocquevillian remnant of the pre-modern tradition that Tocqueville urges his readers to retain. Sort of harbor of treasure, uh, and, and uh, um, uh, to 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 fight against the tendencies within democracy, liberalism, liberal democracy itself, uh, to disassemble those things in the name of equal liberty. Uh, but we, we we may well be past the tipping point, where it's simply not possible to simply say, uh, let's just let's just shore up those institutions. Um, so I suppose you know we, we don't know for sure, and, and history uh, is not written in the sense. So it seems to me that those of us who are in positions to do so um, ought to call for a reconsideration, a reevaluation of where we are. And I would agree with um, David that that will entail some form of thinking about how the law is and invariably and inescapably must be a teacher and the ways in which, uh, as a political community, uh, it's not maybe simply a matter of shoring up, but, but thinking about how we um, revive uh, in, in perhaps in new and different forms, but revive those institutions as central to human flourishing. And if we're on the other side, and there is really no hope for this, then at the very least those of us in a position to do so can create a kind of documentary record uh, that can be unearthed uh, in decades or centuries as a warning for people of what not to do. Patrick, can I just ask you in what sense you think that we're suffering from you know, this imminent spread of tyranny 
I mean, has somebody come up to you in the uniform and said that you cannot write you know, the kind of books that you write, uh, that that's impermissible political discourse? I mean, it seems to me something like cancel culture is actually not tyranny in any kind of classical sense because it's mostly a matter of social pressure. You know, the state is not getting behind uh, uh, you know, this, this sort of thing. And in any event, you know, it's, it's hard for me to imagine a freer society than the one that we live in, I mean, in terms of you know, different ways of life. I mean, you, in your book you say that liberalism has destroyed all existing cultural traditions, and I just don't, you know, that's not the world I'm living in. I, I'm living in a world in which there's a lot of people actually fully enjoying very deep cultural traditions. The only problem is they're different from one another. I mean, it's not a single tradition, but I don't really understand this, um, what seems to me a kind of exaggerated sense of threat that somehow political power is being put behind, you know, the cancellation of anything but liberal uh, culture. I admit, in certain circles, you know, that uh, is done by private power, but, but that's not why I regard this as classical tyranny. So uh, maybe it's uh, what you're not seeing is, and what I am seeing is maybe it's a little bit about where you know where we are, you know, Stanford versus Notre Dame, uh, but I also think um, uh, it's also perhaps where we are. Um, philosophically, theologically, and otherwise. Um, I see not only a private sphere, often backed by the public sphere, that is acting in increasingly disruptive and oppressive ways. I think the laws, uh, and, and to this extent, and here again, I'll go and agree with, uh, with David, the laws uh, increasingly teach us that uh, a kind of disposition that we might call tolerant, but which is increasingly, a generation ago, we called it relativist. But today is increasingly uh, takes the form of you must be tolerant. And if you are not tolerant, in other words, if you don't embody those liberal principles of toleration, you therefore don't, you no longer have standing in this society. Um, I think you know, those of us, speaking as someone at Notre Dame, we have seen the state um, engaging in pretty, pretty extensive forms of oppressive activities, uh, forcing communities of nuns to provide contraception. To, to, to work in those institutions, or my institution in Notre Dame. Uh, increasingly, uh, the um, impermissibility, uh, whether it's in state or the level of institutions that are significantly shaped and informed by the values of the liberal society, making it impermissible uh, to, to articulate, for example, a traditional view of marriage. Uh, and I'll, and I'll, and I'm not saying it's not possible to articulate this, but increasingly to have, then to do that and to have stand in society, uh, to be an accepted member of our society. How many young academics served that without tenure would dare to make those kinds of arguments today? And even with tenure today, would dare to make those arguments today, yeah, knowing so that they're likely to be taken before human resources, again, backed by law, whether state law, federal law, backed by law, with certain knowledge that, uh, or at least, growing knowledge that they're likely uh, to lose their positions and their standing in society. So from where I stand, it seems to me that we are increasingly living in a society which is, I think David's phrase was, uh, was, um, what was it? The liberal uh, egalitarian. Ill illiberal egalitarianism in some ways, or liberal, illiberal liberalism. Um, and it, it seems to me that it's entirely, um, it follows from the logic of the regime. So if I could pose a question to you, in, in, in response, you're, you argue, I think we, we really we diagnose a lot, of the, a lot of our situations similarly, and we draw different conclusions of its sources. But if these phenomena that we describe, what you describe as these contingent pathologies or excesses that are in some ways detachable or can be limited within a liberal order, where is the evidence of this in the liberal order today? Where is a country that we can point to that isn't suffering from one sort of extreme of this or another extreme. In other words, where's the evidence um, of the position that this is merely contingent? Well, not it's kind of so baked into the cake. So the right-wing version is actually very easily... Uh, yeah, no, no, I'm not, I'm, not saying, I'm not saying that they're always present. No, no, but the, 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 the neoliberal distortion uh, is it's a process of being... It, no, it's being, but it's, as we speak, even in Anglo-American, it's being reversed. I mean, the state is now coming back, it's being more regulatory, there's being uh, 
more demands for you know, redistribution. And so that, I think, has been fairly um, uh, easily uh, reversible. Uh, I guess if you say, well, where is this? I mean, first of all, a lot of the, you know, the tyranny that you speak of is, is over a very specific set of issues that have to do with individual rights related to race, ethnicity, gender, sexual orientation. Uh, in virtually every other respect, we live in a super liberal society where you can say anything you want, please. You know, if you want to criticize the people in power, you're perfectly free to do it. You're perfectly free to do it with you know your fellow citizens and so forth. Uh, I think that there is a clear problem in certain cultural precincts, and I would agree with you that uh, it is uh, it is a big problem. It is not liberal in my view. It is you know it is illiberal, but. Uh, it's not also universal because I think, for example, in Europe, I don't know, maybe they're going to follow us down this road, but I do think that it's our particular, you know, racial history and the fact that there's still a lot of unresolved issues there that have made those, that, you know, civil rights in general a particularly neuralgic uh, uh, problem and one that is harder to resolve. But I don't think that that's the case in every liberal democracy. So I'm, uh, I'm seizing power for a second, partly, <laughs> partly to partly to announce that uh, we're going to. I'm not not we, but uh, that we're going to extend to 4:45 rather than 4:30 to, to keep things going. But I also have a question, so I wasn't wasn't just. Um, and and my question is really an objection to Patrick, but let me preface it by saying I'm in considerable agreement with your with your with your diagnosis of the ills of liberalism. So don't, don't take this as expression of more disagreement than it is. But, it can, but it's a point, and it might seem in a way like a quibble, but I think it, it matters for both thinking about what our alternatives are and for the diagnosis of what liberalism was breaking with. And my objection is, is this. It seems to me that the bat that you hit liberalism with is, in, to my mind, too simplistic. The, the, the union of nature and telos, or a teleological conception of nature. And it's, let me just raise three, three quick objections to it. One, you, you speak quick, you oftentimes speak of this as a of classical and Christian virtue. Though there's a very big difference in there, though. I mean, so there, that, there's a real tension. Well, are, are we, is, it, is the alternative classical virtue or Christian virtue? There's a big difference. Secondly, at no real point in history was a teleological conception of nature really politically meaningful. Was it, was it a dominant political thing? That's more of a philosophic notion. There, in fact, in a way, liberalism is the first real doctrine to try to root its its principles in nature. And, and, um, and so what liberalism was breaking with, at least as a political matter, wasn't really a teleological conception of nature, but was a much more of a theological problem. And politics, and problems of politics that have been caused by theological problems. And then the third part of the objection is, uh, and I feel a license to say this, because you, you brought Strauss into the mix. But for Strauss, this was a very big problem. He, he thought that part of the predicament we're in is that modern natural right has led to a kind of dead end in his view, but he thought a teleological conception of nature was no longer tenable. He states this in the, in the introduction of natural right and history as part of the crisis we face, and we can't, that we, we can't restore classical natural right in its classical form because we now see that a teleological conception of nature is no longer a tenable thing. And so it seems to me it's, it's, it's a little, I mean, it, the, the problem is, is, the predicament is deeper if we can't have a teleological conception of nature that we can readily turn to as an alternative. So I, I think I'm always careful, uh, and obviously the I think I went over in my presentation, but it was supposed to be a 20 minute presentation. Uh, I'm not going to be able to tease out all of the strands of the classical tradition in Greek, differences within Greece, Rome, differences between Greece and Rome, within Rome, Christianity, deep and, and pervasive differences within 
within Christianity in relationship to those. I was merely pointing out that I think if there is something, and that Strauss thought there was something that makes these in some senses common, uh, that it, it's a fundamentally reducible to this idea that we are creatures that have a nature and that we have a teleology. Now, of course, there's always been, and, and I think if one holds this view, there always will be a debate over exactly what that nature is and what that telos is. And it seems to me that Aristotle acknowledges this. And this is part of what the art of politics is. Is once we acknowledge that connection, the art of politics is through the best effort, using prudence, wisdom, judgment, justice, and so forth, attempting to ascertain what that connection is. So I don't think it's given or automatic. It's not just known to us like two plus two is equal uh, equals four. Um, so I would be, I'd be the first to acknowledge, and it would be foolish not to acknowledge, the difference between those things. But then your, your second question was um, uh, to suggest that teleology was never political, it was theological. This runs counter to the narrative that I heard in the last session, which is that the dark times that were overcome by liberalism was a time when there was an effort to impose some political teleology. Uh, and now maybe that was a political teleology that was theological in ways. But that's, that's simply, you know, maybe, that's def maybe you regard that as fundamental to the understanding, but it seems to me that the narrative is that there was a dark time when teleology uh, was, uh, was a dominant way of organizing our politics, and that it was figures like Hobbes and Locke and the founding fathers who allowed us to escape that those dark times. Um, and the quote from Peter Berkowitz, I think, you know, suggests that this, this is very much the predominant view that this was uh, the alternative to liberalism is a return to those dark times. Um, I, so I, so I, I, I guess I would just challenge: Can you have it both ways? In some ways, can you have it both ways to suggest that where you know where have we ever seen or has there ever been a society formed or shaped around the idea of teleology, given the challenges that I've acknowledged that that will always have, um, uh, but suggesting that the only form this is taken is in a kind of theological. Form. Now, one might, um, one might conclude that the fact that it's been difficult for human societies to arrive at a, at a common understanding of teleology is reason enough to abandon it. Aristotle didn't think that was reason enough. He acknowledged it's difficult. Like Rawls, I think he regarded that, that the, the fact of pluralism is a fact. The fact of diversity is a fact. That's not hard. The hard thing is developing a political society and political order that shapes and attempts to guide us toward that which is common and towards that which we can share and other aspects of our humanness that allow us to share certain understandings. Now if we if we say that that question can't be asked, we're going to bracket that question, then we're left with the situation we're in right now. And then the question is, is the diagnosis that the pathologies we agree we're experiencing are contingent and accidental or arise out of that solution, well, you know where I stand on this question. Um, but, I, but I think simply it's the, uh, the question that, that we, again, I didn't really get an answer, but again ask is, where do we have evidence that this is contingent? Because it seems to me, Europe is not a good example of where it's contingent at all. Europe, it seems to me, is an advanced stage of decay. Uh, maybe on the more progressive historic side, but it's an advanced stage of decay, political, historical, and other. I don't see evidence uh, that this is merely contingent. I see evidence that is baked into this cake. And we can, all, we can no longer congratulate ourselves as having advanced past the dark ages, because it seems to me we're rapidly entering them ourselves. Um, yes? Yes. Uh, can try to ask a question for one? For one? Yes. Yeah, do that. There seems to be an agreement among all the three panelists that uh, liberalism rests on acceptance of a pre-liberal tradition, at least a healthy form of liberal, liberalism. Oh, uh, okay. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, uh, it seems to me, however, it would be useful to break down uh, the nature of that reliance. One form would be this, that uh, I think uh, David uh, suggested this about uh, the high uh, cultural high, uh, high times of Athens. If you have an older tradition that is breaking down, that's a good time for thinking. It's uh, because uh, you can't think without thinking against something. 
uh, you know, just as in, in Iran, uh, 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 the terrible situation, uh, uh, the terrible theological situation is good time, good time for thinking uh, among anti-theological people. So, so that's one kind of reliance. Another kind of reliance is that um, liberalism just simply presupposes something that it doesn't give an account, but it's not, um, uh, it's, it's not critical of it. So, so for instance, Locke's uh, work gives no account of Englishness, uh, but he doesn't attack Englishness. In fact, he appeals to Englishness. The third possibility, I think, is that uh, liberalism attacks something in the tradition that it very much needs in order for it to succeed well. And, and, and if that's the case, that, that's of course a, a very deep di difficulty. Um, so I think it's, it's useful to not to put all of these things together and, 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 and focusing on the, on the third, uh, just elaborating some of uh, Frank's comments about the, the Ukraine war. And, it's, uh, and, and, uh, and liberals and needs for nationalism. I have a friend who lived in Ukraine for about 20 years ago, and, and what he told me is that at that time, Ukrainians were much less Ukrainians than they are today. So when Putin says that uh, you Ukrainians, they're just Russians. <laughs> Uh, well, uh, there is some element of truth in the past, but in the meantime, they have become more, they have, they have developed a greater sense of national identity. And, and the question is, what is the cause of it? Of course, the threat of Russia is one of the causes, but another cause of it is that Ukra Ukrainian political experience, uh, 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 we don't see it right now in this war because they are united, united but they are a very a fractious uh, group of people, and these uh, political jostling among them has given them a kind of a national identity. And in, so in this respect, you could say it wasn't ancient Ukraine that gave them this national identity, but actually liberal practice. So that's, that's something just to add to the table. So those are, uh, the second two of those, I think, are very good points. But one area where I would challenge anybody to tell me where liberal theory has an answer is in this question of what constitutes the boundaries of a nation, right? Like the question of Catalonia, should Catalonia be a separate nation or should it be a part of Spain? I, I fail to see a theoretical liberal, classical liberal thinker that would give us terribly good insight. And I think John Locke probably sort of thought of, you know, the man of the state of nature as an Englishman. Right, with a lot of cultural characteristics of Englishmen and, and, and that sort of thing. Uh, and, but it's related to the second, the third point, which is that if you look historically at where national identities come from, they are not biological, they do not necessarily derive from ancient cultural traditions, they are created, or as we now put it, they're socially constructed. Uh, and it is perfectly possible to construct a very bad national identity, which is, I think, the one that the Russians uh, are indulging in right now, where you can't be a Russian if you're not dominating your weaker neighbors, or it can be a liberal one. And I think that that's one of the tasks that is up to liberal statesmen, is to create a strong sense of national purpose built around liberal uh, ideas. I think it's possible. I think it happened in the United States, particularly after the you know, the civil rights era, um, but that's you know that's something that um, is a precondition that is really not you know where liberal theory doesn't give you a whole lot of guidance. Can I just respond. Yes. Yeah. Uh, just I, I suspect I'm not sure if this you know, will be sounded on any of the other panels, but I guess I would just like to challenge what I see already as an underlying very weak version of history that we've been subjected to uh, already today and continues to be on display, which is, you know, I think where the fears or the principles or the ideas of liberalism mass or obfuscate the creation of the liberal state, the liberal nation. We tell ourselves a story, this was one of consent. I think Americans were especially prone to view this, that, that this country was founded in consent, the free and open consent of individuals who consented to the Constitution. And as, as Frank put it, that the nation 
good nations create a relatively homogeneous, good nations are a reflection of a relatively homogeneous state. Of course, you know, history is always much more complicated than this. And I think the origins, and uh, if you read more deeply in, and I know Frank does, read more deeply in the, uh, the rise of the state that we regard as the end of the cessation, the liberal state, the cessation of the dark times, the medieval period of oppression, these were times of extraordinary oppression. Forming and shaping a unified and homogeneous people required often extremely violent means. And we certainly know this on our own shores. You know, the, the, the enforced homogeneous creation of an American people, right? beginning with the indigenous people who were here. And we, of course, tend to obfuscate that because we tell ourselves a story about consent, freedom, and individual liberty. So I think uh, I would just sound a, a word of caution or a cautionary note that a lot of the justifications of liberalism that typically assuage ourselves with is that there was a dark time, and we have overcome that dark time by this moment of light. And if we read outside of the works of political philosophy and read the actual history of those moments, we see a very different story uh, that was based on extensive violence, oppression, and I would lastly submit what a condition that has really not given us an awful lot of peace. On that note, uh, we are actually in violation of our social contract with the Graduate Hotel and have to vacate the room uh, immediately. So uh, thank you for, uh, for that, everyone.